Hello, everybody. My name is Pablo Wojcikowski. I'm a faculty member at Northwestern University and the director of the Center for Latinx Digital Media. Thank you so much for joining us for today's weekly virtual seminar of the Center. It is really a pleasure to have you with us. The mission of the Center is to create knowledge about digital media in Latinx and Latin, America's com Latin American communities across the Americas. Today's speaker is a leading scholar in this space. Lisa Flores is Professor and Associate Dean at the University of Colorado. Jose Luis Quintero Ramirez, who's a doctoral candidate at Northwestern and an affiliate at the Center for Latinx Digital Media, will introduce Lisa in just a minute. I am delighted to note that this quarter, our series is co-sponsored by the Alice Kaplan Institute for the Humanities, the Buffett Institute for Global Affairs, the Center for Global Culture and Communication, the Department of Radio, Television and Film, the Latina and Latino Studies Program, and the Program in Latin American and Caribbean Studies. But before we go to the seminar, I would like to start by acknowledging that Northwestern is a community of learners situated within a network of historical and contemporary relationships with Native American tribes, communities, parents, students, and alumni. It is also in close proximity to an urban Native American community in Chicago and near several tribes in the Midwest. The Northwestern campus sits on the traditional homelands of the people of the Council of the Three Fires, the Ojibwe, Potawatomi, and Ottawa, as well as the Menominee, Miami, and Ho-Chunk Nations. It was also a site of trade, travel, gathering, and healing for more than a dozen other native tribes, and is still home to over 100,000 tribal members in the state of Illinois. It is within Northwestern's responsibility as an academic institution to disseminate knowledge about native peoples and the institutions history with them. Consistent with the university's commitment to diversity and inclusion, Northwestern works towards building relationships with Native American communities through academic pursuits, partnerships, historical recognitions, community service, and enrollment efforts. Let me say briefly a little bit more about how the seminar will unfold. First, Jose Luis will tell us more about research, Lisa's uh, research and career in just a few seconds. Then Lisa will deliver the seminar. After that, we will open for questions. Please enter your questions in the Q&A function of the webinar at the bottom of the screen at any point in time. Jose Luis will moderate. At the end, we will deliver some closing remarks. Once again, many thanks for joining us. And without further ado, Jose Luis, the screen is all yours. Thank you, Pablo. It is a, a real pleasure to introduce Dr. Flores. Lisa A. Flores is a professor in the Department of Communication at the University of Colorado Boulder, where she's also the Associate Dean of Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion. She's a renowned rhetoric scholar who last year alone earned nine awards for her research. In her work, Flores studies narratives of privilege and disadvantage, particularly as they play out in public discourse or on questions of race, gender, nation, and labor. She's the author of The Portable and Disposable, Public Rhetoric and the Making of the Illegal Immigrant, published by the University Press of Pennsylvania State in the fall of 2020, as well as num a number of essays appearing in journals, such as the Quarterly Journal of Speech, Rhetoric and Public Affairs, and Critical Studies in Media Communication. Her current work examines mobility and containment as rhetorical mechanisms of race, gender, and sexuality. During the talk, feel free to add questions to the q and I'll be catching those, and at the end of the talk, I'll be able to offer those to Lisa. Uh, so now join me in welcoming Dr. Lisa Flores. Thank you, Pablo, for the invitation to participate in this uh, virtual seminar series, to Mora for all your guidance and help in your patience, and Jose for that wonderful introduction. I, again, am so delighted to be here with you, um, and I look forward to, to thinking with you. When I first sat down to plan my time today, I struggled a lot. Um, I'm a rhetorical scholar, and I spent most of my time recently writing and thinking about U.S. border rhetorics, mostly from a historical perspective that entailed hours upon hours of time with microfilm. And of course, microfilm is a form of digital media, but still I felt old. Um, so I wondered, what does it mean to think with you, especially as I transitioned from a recently completed project to a new one? And I decided to think about this opportunity to be with you in full transparency of my liminal status. I'm working on something new. I'm at the beginning. I have a piece that may resonate with you in the ways that I'm not 
capable of thinking about. And so what I want to talk with you about is border spectacles, um, particularly viral border spectacles populated today by Haitian and Honduran bodies, but also historically by Mexican bodies. Now, of course, border spectacles, border spectacles are not new, even viral ones. But those that populate our national conversation today look and feel a bit different than did the ones uh, from the 1920s and the 1950s, which has been the site of my most recent work. I'm a relatively traditional rhetorical scholar who still finds myself at the U.S.-Mexico border working with a set of artifacts that differ quite dramatically today from those that have influenced much of my writing. So maybe I'm saying this to, share, to say, please think of this um, as a time of thinking together. What I'm going to do is open with current moments and then move to historic. And I'm moving between these uh, historic and current, Haitian, Honduran, and Mexican, as I'm trying to account for the persistent pieces across, but also the interruptions. Um, as I start with these opening scenes from the border, I'll ask you to think about, to view them from a lens of mobility and containment, both literal movement and stoppage, but also metaphoric, um, and um, to think about the pieces of spectacle. The pieces I won't talk about today really are sort of the um, tropic imaging of the bodies. That's a whole nother piece, and um, I don't it's in, almost inevitable um, that that will cross your mind, but that's not really what I'm trying to accomplish today. So um, I'm sure many of you followed the reports in the fall of last year, September, I believe, the reports of the Texas Border Patrol on horseback responding to the Haitian immigrants. It rose to national attention, um, and of course the, the, the coverage of it varied a bit. I wanna show you just one account um, to start us off. Let's see if I can pull this off. There we go. Under the International Bridge in Del Rio in Texas, a camp that's become home to thousands and which reveals yet another crisis at the border in America. They cross the Rio Grande River that forms the border between the US and Mexico, most of them Haitians willing to take the chance that they will be processed and allowed in, willing to tolerate what's been described as a squalid existence here. There is not enough food to give to everybody who's inside there. We need to get out of the camp to look for food. Things are worse. It is these pictures of border patrol agents on horseback pushing migrants into the river that have caused so much anger. For some, they carry the echoes of the worst chapters of American history. You may have also Under the seen reports of the so-called steel wall of cars at the border that was ordered by Texas Governor Greg Abbott at about the same time as the Border Patrol descended upon the Haitian refugees. Maybe you came across President Biden's message to Honduran migrants in early 2021. Here's the text from that article. If you can see right here, it says, don't come now. Of course, the controversy around the Honduran caravan preceded President Biden's more recent message um, and was populated with such discourses as this one. On the Tijuana side of the U.S.-Mexico border today, mayhem. First, it was dozens of Central American migrants racing toward the U.S. border. Then it seemed there were countless. At times, overrunning Mexican authorities in riot gear, climbing their way forward somehow. And no, that's not the U.S. on the other side, but it's close. In return, pushback from the American side was swift. U.S. military helicopters buzzed overhead as it appeared some migrants attempted to breach the border. And before long, from the U.S. side, tear gas fired toward the migrants among them what appeared to be mothers with young children as the chaos deepened and who could forget the summer of 2018 and the accounts of family separation and caged caged children now i could go on and on and on um, but i'll stop here <laughs> 
and I'll stop with these isolated but clearly overlapping scenes. And, and I want to start by noting the convergence of spectacle and what I'm calling immobilities. Now, of course, I'm talking about the U.S.-Mexico border, so it's, of course, going to be filled with national narratives replete with mobility and containment. The U.S.-Mexico border is a site defined in part by movement and stoppage, border crossing and border detention. So why would I pause on the overt? Because I'm also convinced that there's something at the intersection of spectacle and immobilities that is central to what I call rhetorical race making. I also see some pretty clear racial and gendered patterns. Right now, I'm naming those through sterility and virility. Again, this is a, I'm at the very beginning of a project. Um, and I'm attentive to an affective intensity that is consistent. Maybe it's in the comparison between the horses and the refugees. The horses add height and force, while the refugees move through the slowness of walking in water, balancing their limited belongings. Rhetorical scholars remind us that vertical metaphors direct us toward and away from agency, goodness and evil, power and submission. It's no coincidence, then, that the images that resonated with much of the nation in the summer of 2018 emphasize the children in cages lying on the ground. What about the differential patterns of authority? the invocations of President Biden to the migrant caravan, or the access of Governor Abbott to militarized force, steel cars. When do we ever reference cars as made of steel? And how might we think about the images of the horses and the whips, an image that California Representative Maxine Waters named as worse than what we witnessed in slavery? I'm pissed. What the hell are we doing here? What we witness takes us back hundreds of years. What we witnessed was worse than what we witnessed in slavery. Cowboys with their reins again, whipping black people, Haitians into the water where they're scrambling and falling down. And all Later, she's very direct. And let me get to that spot. Boys to do this work. They've got to be gotten rid of. It, they've gotten to be stopped. It cannot go on. She doesn't say now, but I hear the now. I'm pissed. It cannot go on. They've got to be stopped now. There's a language of tempo, of quickness and immediacy. And it's not just in her words, it's also latent in the inferences to magnitude. When we see a line of cars or masses of migrants, these are images of scale and magnitude that call for something to happen right now. These are temporal invocations. I've got the slide here. Don't come, you won't get in immediately. Returning to the Haitian migrants, they trudge through the safety of they trudge towards safety through the water the slowness as they're running there is clear tempo this is um, a, a slide from a headline from the del rio mayor del rio texas we need quick action clearly tempo is critical to the intersections of mobility and containment I imagine you're familiar with the most dominant narratives of the border as the site of both national vulnerability and national sovereignty, as a site replete with spectacle, as a site also comprised, of course, by the mundane and the quotidian. Though there's something critical in the quotidian, today I'll attend to the spectacle. Perhaps the question that lies in the background for me is where do my investments in border rhetorics converge with your interest in Latinx digital media? And I'm wondering if it's in the viral and the spectacle. I'm not going to talk today about the viral, um, but I will instead pause a bit on the spectacle. And again, a critical caveat, this project is brand new. I have not yet done any research on the history and current state of Haitian and Honduran migration. I have not kept up. My partner sent me an article this morning about um, robotic dogs that will now be used at the border. I haven't even had the moment to open that link, right? But I'm so I start here because I know this is where the project will go, but also because if we're watching any kind of digital media today that's around the U.S. border, these are the kinds of images that are replete. And this is the, the border spectacle today is a spectacle as it always has been of mobility and containment, but I think it's a little bit different today. 
So I'm invested in mobility and containment in large part because I study migration and border rhetorics. But I'm also thinking my mobility and containment um, as critical sites of rhetorical race making. In other words, I argue that race is made rhetorically through its very discursive mobilities and containments. Scholars writing on borders and migration have long theorized the rhetorical narration of migration through the movement or the arrest of bodies, often asking how such uh, figurations shape larger racializations and engenderings. Much of this scholarship, both among rhetorical scholars and in interdisciplinary conversations, has argued that movement and containment are constitutive of what rhetorical scholars have widely named border rhetorics, but few, at least that I've come across, have consider considered the inter-implication of mobility and containment. Today, I want to think about rhetorical race making as I explore what I'm currently calling immobilities. I have also been calling it static mobility. I'm, I'm again, still trying to figure this out, right? So I'm thinking immobilities, particularly as they intersect with, the, with spectacle. I invoke immobility as a way to think about what I'm thinking the juncture that is neither mobility nor containment, but it is instead some conflation, not an intersection, I don't think, but some sort of immobility. That juncture encapsulates border spectacle both today and across the long history of our nation's fixation on our land borders. Immobilities, as I invoke them here, constitute a rhetorical making of race through space and time, spectacle, affect, and intensity. Immobility refuses any neat separation of movement and containment, and in doing so, it captures a critical duality. It's a means of accounting for both the literal and rhetorical movement and stoppage of race bodies, as it is also a theory of race as a rhetorical effect named in, on, and beyond the body. It feels almost too obvious to argue that mobilities and containments shape the very structure and essence of race. Must be missing a slide, my apologies. We'll stop here. And yet rhetorical scholars are tasked with the overt and the obvious. Our skill, our insight lies in the interruption of the obvious. I'm attentive to my use of the term essence when I say the very essence of race. I use it deliberately, all too aware that racial essentialism is the premise of white supremacy, another term I use with intention. My work builds on a few pieces. With Nadine Ellers, I theorize race as the effect of affect. With Sarah Ahmed, I begin with proximities. The affective effects that are race are layered with the excesses of its mobilities that come too close. With Catherine Rottenberg, I theorize race as a regulatory ideal. Race performativity, she argues, compels subjects to perform according to fictitious unities. If, as Eller so compellingly argues, blackness is made in the regulatory ideals that comprise anti-miscegenation laws, those laws that attempted to contain blackness by limiting its movement toward whiteness, what would it mean to assess race as always a product of mobility and containment? The bodies that flood the border emerge in and as flood, pure essential excess. The dams that we erect furiously in flood-prone places, such as New Orleans, are but futile and temporary measures to contain that which will not be contained. It is here in the impossibilities of racialized containment that critical rhetorical questions of race and racialization emerge for me. The impossibilities of the containment of race signal the centrality of mobility and containment. These impossibilities, those varied miscegenation laws, and here I invoke that term quite broadly to include any legal, political, cultural, or social effort to regulate the movement of race toward whiteness, those varied laws rise and morph, signaling our many affective orientations. The effect of affect, race exists in its bodily essence. And if you read the news, you know that the racialized gendered bodily excess is allowed only so much movement. So as I begin this project, I do so knowing that there is something about mobility and something about containment. I don't yet fully know what, as if I ever could, but that something is textured with the violences of what I have elsewhere called stoppage. It is layered with chaos and order. It is premised in excess and excessiveness. It emerges in spectacle. A couple of caveats before moving too far forward. This is a transitional pieces, piece. Um, some of the, what I will share to do emerges from my recent book and um, others are new that I, and I think that they will come together. My theoretical moves are tentative and partial, and that makes me very uncomfortable. I don't like to share in progress thinking, but I do so here to make more transparent the messiness of scholarly work. Had I had more years, 
Had I had more patience, I would have developed these arguments into portable and disposable, but instead I held them even as they emerged in and through the writing of that project in ways that I've only come to realize in retrospect. I'm also about to use language that is violent. I'm going to talk about a 1954 um, federal deportation program, and I know that that language will, will fall on our bodies in different kinds of ways. I don't yet know how to do this work without invoking this language. With these disclaimers, let me return to immobility. Again, I define it as a rhetorical mode of race making that fosters racializations through the affective energies of bodies in motion, bodies detained, and bodies same, simultaneously detained while in motion. It encapsulates the frames through which bodies move and stop, as it also, I hope, captures the very flesh of those bodies. Layered with associations of agency, intentionality, and individual will, the tropes of mobility and containment are inescapably constitutive of bodies, making them in all their gendered, race, and sexual complexities. In rhetoric, scholars writing on mobility and containment do not necessarily engage each other's arguments. But I think we have to work at the intersection and explore containment as a mode of racialized mobility. Consider just one all too common racialized discourse here, the arrest. In my opening fragments, the arrest might be captured in the images of Haitians retreating as the force of the cowboy border patrol approaches. It could be the image of submissive children covered in foil blankets inside a larger cage. Maybe it's captured in President Biden's warning to Honduran migrants, nothing happening for you anytime soon, he says. And of course, arrest happens in a lot of different ways. Every time I'm cautioned as a professor, scholar, teacher, and administrator, maybe don't go there, maybe don't say that, my movement and my body are stalled, made still and silent. And of course, we can think about the prototype, the figuration that populates police dramas typically entails the chase, that excessive movement of a racialized, gendered, and or sexual deviant, the capture, an equally excessive force stoppage, a body slammed against a building or thrown on the ground, driven into some kind of physical submission, cuffed and stuffed, and then phys physically moved in containment to various sites and mechanisms. The scenes of racialized immobility surround us because where there is race, there is mobility and containment. Race circulates in all its spectacular affect and the spectacles that constitute a critical part of US border rhetorics saturate the immobilities. In his foundational work, Guy Debord argued that the spectacle is, quote, not a collection of images, rather it is a social relationship between people that is mediated by images, end quote. That mediated relationship forms partly through the abstractions, sound bites or fragments that reduce, maybe even erase complexities. The abstractions and quick connections foster what Marco Brissarelli names a sense of community. In other words, they produce a kind of coming together constituting not just what it means to be an unwanted migrant, but also the we of the nation. That collective race making occurs through what we might think of as the excess as a spectacle. Spectacle, Kendall Phillips and Kona Podmore remind us, rely upon the affective intensities of grandeur, whether manifest in somewhat literal manifestations of scale and size, or in related tropes that align scale and size with everyday associations of good and evil, promise and peril, success and failure. The grandeur of spectacle, they note, overwhelms. And it's here where we can think about the intersections of spectacle with race. Part of my argument today is that race is made rhetorically through its very spectacular immobilities and their many racialized excesses. In his work on blackness, Eric King Watts reminds us that black monstrosity is figured as the excess of excess, almost the excessiveness of excess. Excess and, and excessiveness, he argues, interrupt the grammars of common sense, installing a need to resist the norms of civil society. They do so, according to Herman Gray, by limiting the very registers of legibility. Or as Jennifer Lynn Le Mercier concludes, if blackness is already contained by the excesses of expectation, then quote, black people must continuously move via a kinesthetics of entertainment that is marked by excessive spectacular skill. If excess, perhaps only racialized excess, but if excess shapes the registers of legibility such that already racialized bodies, those too easily attached to historic racial scripts and tropes, can only be read through those racial scripts. How, I wonder, do excess and excessiveness as discourses of gendered racialized chaos and order, mobility and containment, produce gendered racialized bodies? I'll invoke excess 
as the effect of affective discourses of racial threat. It's a mode of racialized bodies that resist containment. I'll reference excessiveness, mostly through containment, those national discourses of white supremacy that promise orderly relief, if not end, from the chaotic excesses of race. The excessive and the excessiveness of mobilities and containment surface the gendered racialization, its varied virilities and sterilities, both of which are already racialized gendered terms of mobility and containment. Now, again, this is a project that is both new and it's a project that's a long time in formation. I've been engaged in the larger rhetorical project, typically named as Border Rhetorics, for about 20 years. And to study border, re border rhetorics is always to give some attention, I think, to mobility and containment. If the problem or the threat of the U.S.-Mexico border is undocumented and massive crossing, the solution or the promise is containment, whether affected by walls, by cages, by tear gas, by horses, by cars, or by deportation. As I build my argument, I want to turn back in time and consider the immobilities of a different affective register of spectacle. The Haitian Honduran crises are marked by spectacles of horses and water, cages and steel walls, but a different spectacle permeated a different border moment. And I think that the differences there are critical, but I don't yet have them fully unpacked, the, the, the connections. So I'm gonna to turn to 1954 and a federal deportation program that has been widely lauded as the largest deportation drive in US history. It escaped most public and even scholarly notice until President Trump invoked it as a model for today. Let me give you a sense of the discourse, an initial sense. Headlines proclaimed the day of wetback labor to be over as they also announced the thousands of arrests in the empty fields. News reports detail the roadblocks, the planes that circle above, that scan for signs of undocumented workers. Again and again, federal officials reiterate their commitment. The efforts will continue as long as necessary until the wetback problem has been effectively eliminated. A persistent but impl implicit message across this discourse is the narrative of the wetback problem. There would not be a thousands of arrests if there was not a problem. However, as this quick overview, I hope begins to make clear, the discourse of Operation Wetback was unlike, at least in my read, much of the contemporary narrative. It is not a narrative of crisis. To be sure, the crisis narrative was there. In the years prior, it was the dominant narrative. And this piece is critical, this tension between the prior and the, and the actual um, operation, both for our understanding of the discourse of Operation Wetback and for the arguments I'm trying to make about immobilities. So let me give you a sense, a, a tiny sense um, of that period. In the years leading up to Operation Wetback, public narratives told a tale that is both very familiar and was familiar then as well. It's the tale of 2021 and the tale of most of the decades in U.S. history since about 1925, much older if we expand our lens to other problematic border crossers, whether Germans, Italians, Chinese, or Japanese. The narrative names the U.S.-Mexico border and sometimes the sea borders as the site of national vulnerability constituted by what the Washington Post defined as the problem created by the presence of the United States and the continued entry of hundreds of thousands of farm workers who have streamed illegally across the border. The New York Times decried the swarms of aliens threatening the U.S., while Newsweek proclaimed a flood of wetbacks. These few snippets of a multi-year era, often reduced to the years of the so-called wetback problem, surface the spatio-temporalities of mobility and containment. Note the emphasis on a particular flow, one that is both ongoing, even incessant, and of considerable magnitude. The Post reminds us of the continued entry, while both the Times and Newsweek invoke metaphors of magnitude defined by chaos and nature, swarms and floods. These invocations still so pervasive today overwhelm. The spatio-temporalities of border crisis, and I'll go so far as to speculate of a racial crisis, motivate a larger affective frame of threat. Mexican migration and race more broadly is out of control, chaotic, even unstoppable. Elsewhere, the New York Times proclaimed, Border Patrol overwhelmed by tidal wave of wetbacks. Sarah Ahmed reminds us that crisis functions to install threat. 
and it does so part through the spatio-temporalities of proximity and contagion. Lessons that we have all learned uh, on our bodies over the past two to three years. Mobility, lack of containment or contagion, and race thus intersect in profoundly affective ways. In her work, Ahmed takes us to Audrey Lord, and the move Ahmed makes is so profound, at least from my thinking, that I'll pause on it at length. And what I'm going to do is read for you a quote from Audrey Lord, cited in multiple places by Sarah Ahmed. The AA subway train to Harlem. I clutch my mother's sleeve, her arms full of shopping bags, Christmas heavy. The wet smell of winter clothes, the trains lurching. My mother spots an almost seat, pushes my little snow-suited body down. On one side of me, a man reading a paper. On the other, a woman in a fur hat staring at me. Her mouth twitches as she stares, and then her gaze drops down, pulling mine with it. Her leather-gloved hand plucks at the line where my new blue snow pants and her sleek fur coat meet. She jerks her coat close to her. I look. I do not see whatever terrible thing she is seeing on the seat between us. Probably a roach. But she has communicated her horror to me. It must be something very bad from the way she's looking, so I pull my snowsuit closer to me, away from it too. When I look up, the woman is still staring at me, her nose holes and eyes huge. And suddenly I realize there is nothing crawling up the seat between us. It is me. She doesn't want her coat to touch. The fur brushes my face as she stands with a shutter and holds onto a strap in the speeding train. Born and bred a New York City child, I quickly slide over to make room for my mother to sit down. No word has been spoken. I'm afraid to say anything to my mother because I don't know what I have done. I look at the side of my snow pants secretly. Is there something on them? Something's going on here. I do not understand, but I will never forget it. The magnitude of mobility, at least certain types of mobility, emerge through what we might imagine as the excesses of race. Think of race as the affective register of race. Excess names the flow of race from the body, its animation beyond itself, a kind of bodily transgression. The excess of race is that which refuses to be fixed and contained. Out of control, the excess of race is the threat of race, for it is that quality of race that belies the rigidity of racial categories. Racial excess, or the protrusion of race from the body, signals its potential to move and contaminate, threatening the purity of whiteness. Excess is then both seen and felt. Indeed, it is the affective effect of the mobility. A particular mode of mobility, the mobility of border crisis, fosters an affective climate of threat that's crucial to my arguments around immobility. What I want to suggest here, following Sarah Ahmed and Brian Masumi, is that threat manifests through its spatio-temporalities. Something becomes dangerous, threatening in its proximities when it moves toward us. Each new mar marker of nearness magnifies the impending danger. Threat is threat through some linkage with violence. Its intensity lies in its spatio-temporal movement. Distant threat feels different than proximal threat. Distant threat is less immediate, less threatening than proximal threat. A contagion, proximal threat moves closer and closer. Mobility is then inflected with particular spatio-temporalities. The spatio-temporalities of racialized mobility are permeated with threat. That threat lies partly in the gendered tenor of threat. A chaos that moves without warning or order, whose force lines in its overlap with nature, the tidal wave of immensity that constitutes mobility at the border is gendered. It is layered with a reproductive force. The threatening body of race exists in a primal savage way, exhibiting an untamed virility or a raw fertility. Regardless, the racialized gendered body cannot be allowed free roam. So what does this mean here as we think Operation Wetback, Spectacle and Immobilities? Let me go back to the summer of 1954 and the national discourse surrounding Operation Wetback. Again, it was a federal deportation drive, and deportation is premised on a complex interplay between mobility and containment, a controlled and contained movement of massive numbers of bodies. Absent all the chaos of undocumented border crossing... Something went wrong. Please try again. Sorry. Siri. Absent all of the chaos of undocumented border crossing, deportation is structured, precise, and planned. Though it manifests a similar magnitude of scale, it gathers its strength, its threat from its precise virility, a virility that does not need the primal savage force of a variant of masculinity, 
Instead, this is the virility of authority and dominance. Notably, then, the immobilities operate on different affective registers. Understated, even flat, the spectacle of 1954 relies upon a more a muted expression of power. So let me give you a, a, just a snippet of context. Operation Wetback was the first widely pronounced deportation drive in U.S. history. There is a sense even today that it stands as a unique moment, not because it was the first time that the U.S. engaged in widespread deportation, or even that it was the most massive deportation drive in U.S. history. It was neither of those. For some, the uniqueness lies in its rhetorical patterns, its proclamations of scale. The headlines at the time and the narratives that followed in both public and scholarly spaces reported the deportation of over a million migrants across all variants of residency status, including U.S.-born citizens. But perhaps the key points of context for us to consider today are these. First, the typical figure of 1.3 million deportations is probably not accurate. This is critical if for no other reasons than the virility that permeates these immobilities are premised on scale, magnitude, a type of spectacle. Massive numbers of undocumented Mexicans quickly and easily captured and moved back into Mexico. Second, the rhetorical framing of the drive as a response to the wetback problem was selective, even exaggerated. Historian Kelly Little Hernandez argues that the crisis had little to do with undocumented migration. Instead, she names it a, quote, crisis of consent. Agribusiness and small farmers across the Southwest, especially in South Texas, refused to comply with mandates that they rely upon government-supplied contract laborers, mostly from Mexico. These workers, named braceros, came into the U.S. through formal governmental means. That structural piece of migration complicated historic patterns of access to undocumented labor. Braceros had to be monitored and regulated. They had to be given food, housing, and contracts. They were a little bit more expensive than undocumented migrants, and growers in the Southwest were not interested. Now, this is too quick, too short, too fast, but the point is that the Border Patrol experienced themselves as vulnerable to a national public that ridiculed, even infantilized, and emasculated them. Hernandez unpacks the traditional narrative that names Operation Wetback as a massive endeavor, wildly successful in bringing a national crisis of undocumented migra migration into controls, and argues instead that what was at stake was the reputation and authority of the Border Patrol and Immigration and Naturalization Services, or INS, the predecessors to ICE. In what she names a, quote, statistical sleight of hand, INS Commissioner Joseph Swing launched a rhetorical campaign that declared crisis and solution all at once. What we remember as an extended endeavor that deported at least a million, if not 1.5 million migrants, lasted, she says, all of 20 days and produced 33,307 arrests. But the discourse of the time was saturated with a narrative of military force. Indeed, she goes on to argue that the militarization of the border originated with Operation Wetback, not during the Reagan era, as so many scholars have argued. That discourse of military mobilization that produces a spectacle of containment is critical to thinking about the immobilities at play, especially as they turn on the gendered racializations of virility and sterility. The first piece of this immobility lies in the two most pervasive thematics of the discourse, mobility or containment. Consider this headline. Border Patrol picks up a total of 96,677 wetbacks. In the news report that followed this headline, Attorney General Herbert Brunell names a simultaneity of mobility and containment as he notes the success of Operation Wetback. It is the greatest migration in this country in modern times. In a multi-pronged effort with patrols on the ground and in the air, Border Patrol agents, agents canvassed the Rio Grande Valley of South Texas, that fertile agricultural area bordering Mexico that relied heavily on Mexican labor. Equine accounts reported days earlier across Arizona and California, the Laredo Times, along with the various regional newspapers in South Texas, narrated a dramatic story replete with blockades, special forces, mobile units, and coordinated land and air efforts. So the very practices of containment come through the technologies of mobility. They are intertwined. Planes swooped low over farms in the Fertile Valley, spotting groups of workers. They radioed the location to border patrolmen in jeeps who hurried to sort them out. In what the San Antonio Times named the opening phase of the Valley Wetback Roundup, biggest in Valley history, the drive would consist of a motorized cavalry roundup with an airplane observer directing activity. The Edinburgh Daily Review chimed in, noting that, quote, a number of airplanes would spark plug the roundup. That intersection of mobility and containment interrupts the prevalent crisis narrative and installs in its place the affective possibilities of promise or hope. The hope lies 
in the promise of containment, again manifest in the numbers. Now, if the excess, if the threat of the excess of race manifests in intensified mobilities, the hope of race lies in the possibilities that it too can be contained, controlled, monitored, and managed. Here again, I draw on Sarah Ahmed and her articulation of the promise. Ahmed argues that we have to think about the connections between happiness and living what she calls the good life. She reminds us that in classical Greek writing, the good life was exclusive, available only to the elite. She states, quote, the classical concept of the good life relied on a political economy. Some people have to work in order to give others the time to pursue the good life. The good life then is premised on racialized hierarchies. And these racialized hierarchies tell us something about um, race racialization and the spatio-temporalities of mobility and containment. Again, the promise lies in containment. The invocations of arrest proclaim to the nation that the chaos and excesses of racial mobility can be stalled. From the very first day, headlines and news reports pronounced success, and with each new day, the evidence of containment grew. Operation Wetback was named a marked, even dramatic success. U.S. border agents had captured, nabbed, rounded up wetbacks across the U.S.-Mexico border. Indeed, the efforts were so effective that across the agricultural fields of California, Arizona, and Texas, border agents were almost unnecessary. Offering evidence of their success, the reports soon emphasized the buses filled with Mexican migrants that would travel from the southernmost tip of Texas, almost 800 miles to El Paso, where Mexicans were deported, or they detailed the boats that would take Mexicans arrested at the border far into the, into the far shores of Mexico, the trains that would take them into the interior. The rationale for the practices is clear, deposit Mexicans far from their homes so that they will not return for the US. But imagine an 800 mile trip by bus in South Texas in July. By today's very um, Google map sites and GPS the trip by car takes 11 hours. It's suspect in 1954, it was more than a bit longer. And if your image of a Greyhound bus is influenced by a recent experience, let me remind you that the Greyhound bus of 1954 does not quite compare. The image of the bus speeding along the highway strikes me as oddly phallic, a virile masculine mode of control. I imagine the stifling heat and oppressive humidity of Texas in July and envision the bus is filled to or beyond capacity. Too many arrested men, bodies stilled by the lack of space and the movement across space. What to make of the temporal dislocation of displays of sophisticated militarism against the weathered, fatigued Mexican men made simple, even backward and impotent in their easy arrest and willing submission. I find it almost impossible to think through the US-Mexico border without attending to the varied manifestations of mobility and containment. For a long time, I focused on one or the other, but the reality is that mobility and containment are not, nor can they ever be fully separate and discrete. In her work on mobility and containment, Genevieve Carbio, discussing the traffic stop, typically ordered at the hand of the police, argues, for non-whites, racialization is experienced as the multiple ways their mobility and immobility is coerced through systems of power. The parallel statement might be, for whites, racialization is experienced as the multiple ways their mobility and immobility is unregulated. Now, of course, we'd have to nuance those statements, bringing an intersectional queer feminist lens that also attends to ability and citizenship. And rhetorical scholars in communication have detailed the gendered practices of containment. Those extensions aside, what Carpio reminds us is that mobility and containment are modes of racialization, modes of rhetorical racialization, for it is not just in the moment of the traffic stop but instead and more expansively in the discourses of mobility and containment. I should be able to end my final words with a profound so what, but I'm not there yet. I'm, I'm wrestling with the parts of the so what, the immobilities of gendered rhetorical race making surround us. I'm convinced that the threat of race lies in its excessive mobility and the hope of race in its violent containment. With rhetorical scholars Ursula Orr, Matthew Hodick, and Logan Gomez, I know that the future of rhetorical study here needs to lie with spatio-temporalities. We have to unpack the whiteness in our theories of temporality. With those such as Nicholas de Genova and Natalie Putz, I'm convinced that global practices of, my, of migration and deportation will continue to constitute the live, lived experiences of massive populations of communities and will continue to shape both national and global structures of power. Those practices, as scholars such as Karma Chavez and Annie Hillwright, merge with queer migration, migration regimes in critical trafficking studies. We know that mobility and containment structured the lives of racialized bodies through at least U.S. history, and that ca caveat on U.S. history reflects only the limitations of my reading 
We know the transatlantic slave trade and the mass extermination of indigenous populations were possible only through the mechanisms of mobility and containment. These many imperatives tell me that there's something here that needs our attention. Thank you. Thank you so much, Professor Flores. That was a, a wonderful talk. Uh, we have some questions already coming in, but I wanted to start with one of my own. Um, I was actually curious about your object, uh, not the, the contemporary videos, but the news articles about Operation Wetback. And I was wondering um, if there's any archived responses uh, to, to the operation outside of the official or perhaps the legacy media way that it was being reported. It occurred to me that uh, when we're talking about access and affect in the contemporary videos, um, these also read as an access and response. Right? It seems like overwhelming the picture of the, the lines of cars. Um, they're both horrifying and a little silly, if you'll excuse me saying that, it's right, they're just in the access and response as well. Um, and I'm curious if the, your object of, of Operation Wetback has also some of those. Um, any responses you might be able to read that were off the time? Um, in terms of, so if I'm following, I think that this is the piece that really interests me here and that um, I, I will be, I'll, I'll be building out. Both discourses are saturated with excess, with uh, magnitude, with scale, um, and yet um, there's a sense in which that um, that excess seems the spectacle and, and of, of excess seems differently overwhelming because, as you know, so so I, I know that they seem silly, right? But at the time, they probably didn't. Um, the the critical pieces for me are these: what happens when the the affective excess um, lies with the ability of the nation to capture 1.5 million Mexicans and send them against um, the excess of 1.5 million migrants coming in, right? So both of them are excesses of grandeur that overwhelm, that move in, that move out. Um, and the piece that's most apparent to me right now is the affective intensity. Um, one of them is just sort of like stated it's uh, the more time I spend with the um, archive from South Texas um, and I chose South, South Texas to start for this archive because South Texas um, farmers both small and large um, harassed Border Patrol agents during Operation Wetback um, literally tried to interrupt their movement um, and mocked them and made fun of them and so it's really interested in starting with the South Texas narrative which is, seems different from what happened in California Arizona and New Mexico um, but, they, but the more time I spent with it, the more I was sort of like, wow, there is nothing in these, I mean, it's almost a boring story um, because there is no affect, that the, I kept saying there is no affective intensity. And, and today what I'm saying is the affective intensity is that of authority, which operates on just stating the piece, right? Um, and we don't see that today. We don't see it in any presidential administration, right? So I, I named both Biden and Trump and that's because um, because what we see always at the border today is the crisis, the fear, the threat, the, the, right? And so there's an, there, there are different temporalities, right? So that's maybe the pieces that I'm most clear upon right now. Perfect, thank you. Right, I'm gonna read one of the questions from the crowd. This one's coming via Sarah Itzik, um, who says, thank you for sharing this work with us, double exclamation mark. Um, I love your theory of immobility, and I'm wondering if you see it being useful to apply to other kinds of racialized spectacle with different valences. For instance, depictions of orphans or refugees from the global south or developing nations, either historically or today. And thank you. Yeah, thank you, Louis, uh, Jose, and thank you, Sarah. Um, I think so. Um, you know, I, I think it's going to look different, but it. Um, if. If I'm right in building off of um, Nadine Ellers with Race is the Effective Affect and Sarah Ahmed with the mobility piece of the contagion of the proximities of too close and too far, um, then I think that these are patterns that likely pervade um, racialized threat, gender threat, um, sexual threat. I mean, I think that these are, are patterns of threat that will, of course, emerge um, in different kinds of, of ways. And, and, I, and, and it makes me, um, wonder whether um, mobility and containment and or immobilities become a central part of how it is that race is made right so 
I would love to see you, Sarah, build that out across um, your objects of study. You know, I, um, of course, I that's, this is where I spend all my time. So I think there is a lot um, there that we we have to figure out. Thank you. Um, I believe now Facundo has a question. Yeah, thank you, Jose. Uh, thank you, uh, Professor Flores, for this very insightful uh, presentation. Um, I was thinking about um, this uh, kind of paradox uh, in which we have like a increasing, uh, increasingly mobility of certain types of goods uh, and services, like in terms of globalization. And but at the same time, as you described, this increasing uh, sort of like response in terms of protecting borders uh, in uh, in the states. Um, and I was wondering if also like thinking about this idea of the disposable, I was wondering if you found any evidence of like sort of like uh, discernible mobility in terms of like in terms of like what type of bodies, objects, goods are uh, in contraposition of like the non discernible mobility are being like uh, received or well received or like well um, yeah, like and not as you frame or in terms of like the rhetorical frame of what type of body has no wanted uh, uh, in some uh, uh, in some way or historical periods. Sorry, I think you're muted. <laughs> yes, luckily uh, the screen tells me you're that I'm talking about muted. Um, so I think this is an amazing question. And as you were uh, you, as you were asking, I was thinking, all right. So what are these other bodies? Um, and how is it that, that they emerge? You know, I am so struck right now in part um, by, uh, by the fact that I spend about 90% of my work week doing administrative stuff. Um, and um, in some ways being the, um, I feel like I'm the favorite mascot on my campus because, um, oh, Lisa's so nice. I'm white skinned, like, you know, I've got, I do, I, I, I know how to move in white spaces in a particular way. And then I think, and that's why I just got patted on the head and sent to the corners like, oh, thank you, Lisa. Now go sit down and and, and um, behave yourself, right? It is that pattern um, that is pervasive across that um, the threat of race is not just the threat of uh, the numerical threats um, or the threat of um, violence. It's the threat that um, whiteness is not superior. And every racialized body, every gendered body, every every body marked deviant manifests that some mode of that kind of threat. Um, I, and again, I think it's contagion, right? So, so what if some of us really are actually intelligent enough to belong in higher education? Well, that is his own mobilization of threat that comes too close, right? And and again, this is takes me back to Nadine Ellers, who argues that um, the threat of race hits at the ont the ontological. Um, insecurity of race, that so maybe it is not real. Um, and if it is not real, then there is nothing about whiteness that's superior. And so so I think it, it doesn't matter which body or what how the body moves. Um, the existence of the body in the space is the constant trigger of the threat. A, a little over um, dramatic maybe, but it's also, it seems to me to account for um, the varied mechanisms of containment that we see. I don't know if that helps. I don't know if I, I don't know if I got all the pieces. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you. Now I believe Val has a question. Thank you, Professor Flores, for such a powerful and really important presentation. Um, you mentioned how race is made rhetorically through various discourses and containments, and I'm wondering if you can expand a little bit on what you mentioned on how. Um, specifically on how the mechanisms through which blackness is made, especially through the lens of containing blackness by limiting movement towards whiteness. If you can expand a bit on that, that'd be great. Thank you so much. Yeah, of course, Val, thank you. Um, again, I'm gonna take, go back to Nadine Ellers because of course um, my thinking here uh, emerges from her, um, her first book, which I still um, return to time and again. And um, she really starts with miscegenation laws, the law that prevents um, blacks and whites from coming together, right? That would produce mixed race bodies. And then she sort of builds it out metaphorically, right? And so I think it's that metaphorical build out that I find um, really so compelling because what it would say is that um, anything about blackness that comes close to whiteness is threat. Um, 
And now today I'd want to, when I, when I was first reading that book, um, my thinking was very much in a U.S. black, white binary. My thinking on race was still very much in a U.S. black, white binary. And so in that mode, blackness, um, as I think the carrier of, um, of the extreme, the extremities of racial otherness, it is racial otherness. And then other bodies, you know, we move in between, um, you know, every time I think about, um, I've been doing some reading on student loan debt um, and on the disparity between um, student loan debt. And, and here's a piece, and, and I give you this example to try to, you know, alongside what for me is the, mar the most marked, and that is um, the police murder of blacks on a daily basis, right? So that's one mode of stoppage, you know, moving because you're black gets you killed. But the other mode, um, this statistic comes from the edu from ed, ed Trust, Education Trust, and I might not have it exactly, but that um, uh, black and white entering college students um, take out slightly disparate amounts of loan debt. Black students take out about $7,000 more. It's a lot, but it's not overwhelming. 20 years after graduation, um, white, white borrowers have paid off 94%, black borrowers still owe 95%. The disparities have a whole range of pieces, right? And, and we could go into all of them here, but it's a mode of stoppage, right? How do you ensure continued poverty? You offer loans and higher education in ways that invite blacks in, but give them nothing in order to, right? And so those are the, it's, it's, it's all of these, right? It's the mundane and the quotidian and the spectacular that I think all kind of circulate. And, you know, where we attend at the moment, um, we, could, we could enter the conversation at any point, but I think that there is nothing about um, blackness in the U.S. that is not about mobility and containment or immobility. I believe Mora has a question as well. Um, I do. Um, thank you very much, Professor Flores, for this really uh, insightful presentation. Oh, there's actually a question from the audience. Maybe that should have a priority. Yes, so Jose, please go ahead. You got it. Uh, this one's coming via Lawrence D. Baker. Um, thank you for this interesting talk. Uh, I also have a question. Can you recommend me any books, articles, authors which deal with US migration history in a critical way? Given your expertise in historical migration narratives, I was wondering what your go-to sources are. Um. Yes, so I think I think it depends. Um, if we're looking at the contemporary stuff, um, I'm really compelled by um, uh, the work. Um, well, there's a, there's an incredible compilation called the Deportation Regime, co-edited by um, Nicholas Dejudova and Natalie Puth, P-E-U-T-Z. Um, the historic pieces, which are the ones that always call me, um, I'm probably not going to be able to pull titles right now, but um, gosh, <laughs> you know, Lawrence, um, email me because um, I feel like the bookcase is full. Um, um, but of course, in the moment, I cannot tell, give you a, a, a single piece. Um, I'm so sorry, <laughs> blanking on that. Don't yes. worry, Lisa. Yeah. Mora, do you want to uh, pose your question and after that we close? Uh, yes, I can, I can say my question. Um, so thank you, Professor Flores, for this really important presentation. And um, maybe my question is uh, similar to the question that Facundo made, um, perhaps specific about digital media. I was thinking about the so-called field of um, digital migration studies, right, which analyzes how uh, communities of people that have to migrate or move uh, either voluntarily or involuntarily make use of these so-called mobile communication technologies to actually keep uh, you know, relations across borders. Uh, and, and, and this scholarship shows uh, particularly how important mobile communication technologies become in this community. So I couldn't help but think about the contradiction right, between the importance of containment in the construction uh, of, of uh, the control of the borders, and at the same time, the importance that the mobility of communication has uh, for, for communities of people that have to migrate. So I was just wondering whether uh, you agree with me with this contradiction, how, how do you incorporate this into your theory? Thank you very much.
Yeah, I'm gonna um, I'm gonna take a slightly different tangent, Mora, and say um, uh, one of the pieces that black scholars are writing about today and have been writing about for a long time is you know the 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 persistence of resilience of survival. Um, and if we think about um, slavery and the, the refusal, like the absolute, uh, you know, what was forbidden, communication, language, reading, right? And then the emergence of song as a mode of connection community, right? Connection enables proliferation, enables survival, right? And so um, I think these mobile, now I, have, I know nothing here other than to say, when modes of connection remain, communities don't just survive, they find um, resilience, right? And so they, they move to something that um, allows for moments of joy amidst devastation, right? And so what I would have to imagine if we if we looked at through, that that's exactly what we're seeing. It's knowledge as well, right? Of course, how, how to navigate the routes, how to find the connections, where you can find resources. But I think it's it's even more than that. It's, um, it's a different um, opportunity into a different kind of life than is what is typically allowed. Thank you, Lisa, for this very insightful answer and in general for a truly wonderful presentation. Um, thank you, Jose Luis, for great moderation as always. Thank you to our audience for staying with us uh, through the end. And I invite everybody to join next week for the presentation of Reinaldo Morales, um, our colleague at Northwestern at uh, the virtual seminar series of the Center for Latinx Digital Media. Thank you again, Lisa.